I think in the meantime, hey Raj, hello. Hey, hey. Hey, welcome uh, to Kazoo Tech Talks and yeah, big hello to Chicago. How are you doing today? I am doing great. I, I, I was just telling you that uh, the weather's really nice. It's sunny and uh, yeah, it's looking forward to the upcoming weather conditions. <laughs> okay. Great stuff. So introducing Raj Subramaya. Um, I've, I, I would call Raj a friend of mine. We've been in touch over social media for some years already. And then three years ago, we actually had the chance to meet for the first time in real life in Vienna for Testing United Software Testing Conference. And uh, I'm not sure if you've ever experienced Raj, but he's a, he's a bundle of energy. So he's officially a tech career strategist and entrepreneur with his own uh, consulting company. He's a keynote speaker internationally. Um, then he's an author as well of the book, uh, Skyrocket Your Career. He's a uh, TEDx speaker as well, a software test consultant. So, uh, you know, the list is sheer endless. Is there something you're not doing? <laughs> So um, one question to you to, to start off, uh, Raj, with uh, so many gigs, is there actually one habit or one ritual you do before you start a, a busy day? So three things. One is uh, I wake up before my kid wakes up, my two and a half year old. I wake up at 5 a.m. in the morning. I need to have my cup of coffee in silence. Second thing is I do meditation. Third thing is I do a mind dump of uh, different things in my mind. And then that helps me to figure out, okay, what my day looks like. So those are the three things I've been consistently doing for the past four years, which has really, really helped my mental health. And I'll be talking about that a little bit during my talk as well. Great stuff. Thanks for sharing that. And then one more question before I hand over to you. Uh, you're a tech career strategist. Uh, what does that mean? So at first I was, Okay, first, let's take a step back. So I help people specifically in the tech space to find their dream job and become successful leaders. And so my niche is just focusing on people in engineering field and tech to help them get unstuck in their careers. At first, I, was, I branded myself as tech career coach, but then I'm not a big fan of the word coach. It's like saying best practices, just the best practice you need to follow. So because... Anytime I help people, there's, there's always something I can learn from them and vice versa. Just because I have experience in something doesn't mean that they don't have experience in anything. So I rebranded myself from coach to strategist because that's literally what I do. I provide strategies, a three-month plan, a six-month plan, or a one-year plan to help people figure out where they want to go and what are the milestones they have to hit to reach that goal. So literally provide a blueprint or strategy for them to follow. So that's why I'm a tech career strategist because that's more apt to what I do. Okay, great stuff. And now you'll provide us with the blueprint to the path to stable mental health in a distracted world. So really looking forward to this talk. Raj, take it away. Thank you, thank you. Let me share my screen here. So you should be able to see my screen now. Yes, works. Works fine. Cool, cool, cool. So let me start my timer here because when it comes to topics which I'm really passionate about, I can actually talk a lot. So I try to time myself here so, <laughs> so that I don't go overboard here. Anyways, cool. So before I start, a couple of things. First thing is I'm really grateful to be invited as a speaker here. I never take any of my speaking gigs for granted. I consider it as a privilege and I'm very grateful for Kazoo for bringing me in as a speaker. Second thing is today I'm gonna to talk about my personal journey towards a stabler mental health. And while explaining my journey, I'm gonna give you actionable strategies and tips which I have followed which you could probably use immediately in your daily activities to help in your mental health as well. And as Jem was saying, I'm going to give you different strategies. Then you can apply it in your context and see which one works for you. But I am going to literally give you insights into where I was, how I am today, and what are the different strategies I follow 
consistently for better mental health. And as in men, if uh, people have questions, make sure you put that in the chat window because we're going to answer that. And uh, yeah, just keep those questions coming. And uh, that's why Jim and, and I are here as well. So that being said, let's just get started. Let me do this. Okay, cool. So a quick introduction about me. I'm a tech career strategist. So I help tech folks find their dream job and become successful leaders. I've been in the tech space for over 17 years now. And uh, I love helping people who have limiting beliefs, who feel they're the underdogs to figure out what their passion is and figure out that they're more than what they think they are and give them a pathway towards in personal life and career growth. I'm also a writer and uh, an author as well, which I'll talk about in a second. And then I'm a speaker as well. So I speak at a lot of private events for companies like this. I speak at conferences. And uh, yeah, I also had, I did a couple of TEDx talks last year as well. All information about me can be found on the website, rajsubra.com. Talking about being an author. So as Ron said, I am the author of Skyrocket Your Career. And uh, it is a book about career advancement from the time I take you through a journey of what I call, call as the job application life cycle, where I take you through a series of exercises to figure out what your ideal career options are. Then how do you do that? Then how do you update a LinkedIn based on that? How do you build your resume? How do you ace interviews? How do you negotiate your salary? Once you get a job, how do you be successful in it? And once you're successful in, in a job, how do you become a rock star at the job, right? So I take you through the entire job life cycle and that's my book. Uh, yeah, definitely you can go check it out and download the first chapter for free as well from this website. With that being said, let's get into the topic for today. I'm going to share my real life story, my journey into mental health, how I transform my life, my whole transformation process. And I'm going to share a lot of productivity and mindfulness hacks, which I use on a daily basis, which has significantly helped me have better mental health and perform at a really, really high level. It's funny because as and when just before the stock, my two and a half year old kid is sick. He is above <laughs> my room. He was crying and I had to take care of him. And then just five minutes before I came here again, right? That's life. But how do I still manage to be stable and give the stock? Those are the things we're going to cover. So let's start with my story. So I grew up in the southern part of India and I was always the underdog. I had my dad who who is super smart throughout his life. He studied in scholarships. Then you have my brother who is a genius. He has three masters and a PhD. <laughs> then there I was the average kid who didn't do well in anything, right? Academic sports, dating, you name it. I was the average in everything. So I constantly had this inferiority complex within me that I was not good enough because I was surrounded by all these overachievers around me. And this kind of continued throughout my childhood. And because of these experiences, I developed anxiety, stress, depression, which I still have, but now I'm able to, you know, uh, have a good relationship with that because of the strategies which I'm going to talk about. But the thing is, throughout my childhood, I had this inferiority complex that I wasn't good enough. So when I finally entered the workforce, I made a decision that, you know what? I'm going to build as much fame and credibility as possible to let people know that I'm worth it. I'm enough. And people should, you know, pay attention to me. So that was my only goal. So I worked extremely hard. I started saying yes to every opportunity that came my way. I pushed myself out of my comfort zone. And all these things which I did helped me get all these fame and accolades where I was rated star performer in six out of my seven companies. I exponentially increased my salary by over 150% in 10 years. And then I got various awards. I became a conference speaker. I did keynotes. Life is so good, right? Or at least that's what I thought. 
But then <laughs> things slowly started creeping up for me because um, yeah, for some reason, the animation is not working here. Let me see here. Okay. So I was trying to do things. My body was saying one thing, <laughs> but my mind was saying another thing. I was pushing myself so much for over a decade. And one of the consequences of saying yes to everything is that you overwork yourself. For over a decade, I pushed myself so much that I went back into this place of anxiety, depression, stress, which I once wanted to escape. <laughs> and then it happened. So I, let me see here. So I, it, it was 2018, and I still remember this moment vividly. I was, it was past midnight and then I wanted to go to the bathroom. So I go to my bathroom and then after I enter the bathroom, all of a sudden everything starts darkening around me. And then I just blacked out. And then I believe I hit my head against the bathtub and then I was unconscious on the floor. My wife noticed that I hadn't returned back to, to the bedroom for 25 minutes and then she started looking for me. So she came back, she came to the bathroom and only to see me there all unconscious there. And I was, you know, I wasn't awake. And then she tried to wake me up. And finally, you know, after a couple of minutes, I regained consciousness. Then I told her, honey, I'm not able to move. I'm, I'm, I couldn't move my body. So she dragged my body and laid it on, on the wall. And then I had to go to the hospital and they immediately looking at my condition. They said he has to go to the ER right now. And then in the ER, they actually took a lot of tests and um, they were giving me IV fluids and all the things to make sure, you know, to try to diagnose what was happening because I couldn't, you know, move. Anyways, to cut a long story short, I was diagnosed with um, severe dehydration, stress, and burnout. And my doctor was saying that uh, if you continue like this, you could even get a heart attack and you could have a lot of problem. And you're lucky that it just ended up this way, but it could be even worse. And then as they were taking tests, I was looking at the ceiling, trying to figure out how did this actually happen, right? Because here I was chasing fame and money and proving that I was worth it. But at what cost? Because if I have all these fame and money, but <laughs> if I'm not able to have a life to enjoy it and be there for my family, then why did I do all this work? And this is a picture of me in the ER as well. And uh, true story. So that's when I realized, you know what? I really have to change my life and I have to do something. <laughs> I'm still smiling, I know. Oh, by the way, I was super high. So I had no idea what was happening. So yeah, I, I was smiling. <laughs> but the point is, I decided it was time for me to change because this is the thing, folks. Your self-worth should be driven by your actions, not the results. And I came to that realization on that day. And there's this fine line between dedication, perfection, and obsession. You have to be really careful about that line. And that's what I realized. I said, you know what? I really have to change my life. This is not who I am. I want to live further <laughs> for myself and for my family. That's when the whole transformation process happened. I took a journey of self-exploration where for four months, I listened to 150 podcasts and I read 30 books and it changed my life. And all the things which I'm gonna talk about was the things 
which went through my head when I was in the ER, the awakening and the all the things that four months of self-exploration taught me, which still giving me a lot of benefits since then, right? Here's a recent study. A recent study found that people in tech, like 60% of people in tech suffer burnout at various levels. They just don't know it yet. And according to Amer according to the American Psychology Association, nearly eight in 10 adults say that the COVID-19 pandemic has caused significant source of stress in their lives. But how are they coping with the demands of life coupled with survival? That's why it's hard, folks. The pandemic is a significant source of stress. And that's why you really have to figure out, okay, how do you preserve your mental health when there's chaos around you? So I decided it was time and then I have to transform. And here are the things I did to significantly and drastically change my life. And again, all these things were a slow, gradual process, but I'm gonna share the different things which actually work for me. And some of these things may work for you in your context as well. First thing first is there were two books which really inspired me to change my life. One book is called Deep Work by Cal Newport. He's a computer science professor here in the United States in Georgetown University. And he talks about focusing on one single thing in time box sessions. And for all the testers out there, it's like session-based exploratory testing where you have time box sessions focused on one particular module. Similar kind of concept is deep work where you're focusing on one cognitively demanding task with no interruptions. Your phone is on do not disturb. You lock yourself and just, just focus, right? That is deep work. And a lot of people do deep work and they're super successful. We just don't know about who does deep work, right? And all the successful people you see practice this approach. In fact, I wrote about how I do deep work and then I have templates as well, which you could download. But this is a book which I highly recommend to really try to focus on things you're doing. The next book, which was super influential in my transformation was Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Vaden. This is the thing. <laughs> Everyone talks about time management, but the truth is you cannot manage time. Time moves on whether you like it or not. The thing you need to think about is how are you going to manage yourself within the given time frame? That's the question. That's the thing we need to keep thinking about. And this book hits on that point quite a bit. And one of the things he talks about in that book it's called the focus funnel, which I still follow in my decision making process. So managers or testers or developers or whoever is watching this talk, think about this focus funnel because it really can change your life. It has the potential to do that. This is how it works. Say you have ta a task A, okay? And you have to filter it through five stages. The first thing you need to think about is whether task A can be eliminated. If it cannot be eliminated, the next thing you need to think about is whether it can be automated. If it cannot be automated, the next thing you need to think about is whether it can be delegated to someone. If it cannot be delegated, then the next four stages procrastinate, which is can can you delay it a little further? And if it if you cannot delay it a little further, then the fifth stage is concentrate, which is that's the most important thing you have to work on right now. And since I read this book. I started using focus funnel for my decision making process. If someone says something, I usually put them through this focus funnel and then see what can be done. And this is especially helpful for folks who are handling multiple things at once, like me. For example, I do speaking, I do coaching, I do writing, you know, and then there's a million other things which I work on. Of course, I'm saying other people also have multiple things to work on, but I'm saying when once you get higher up the ladder in leadership roles and stuff, you have to start prioritizing your time. And this focus funnel is really, really gonna help. Now let's talk about the crux of today's talk, which is what were the different strategies which I uh, started following to significantly 
restore my mental health. So the first thing is, I'm going to share my planning routine. So a lot of people ask me, how do you do so many different things? Because as I'm speaking right now, I, uh, I'm building my online course. I write for various publications. I do consulting. I do group coaching. Then I do one-on-one -on -one coaching. I do a lot of speaking gigs. Then I help a lot of conferences. And then I also have my personal life where I have to take care of my family. I have to be there for them. I have to spend time. I, I value my time. So how do I do all these things without going crazy? This is where my planning routine comes in. Say so there are two things you gotta, you're going to make note in this slide. First thing is let's talk about the daily task planning routine, which I follow. So at the start, Ron asked me, hey, what's a routine which you follow every day, which sets you up for success and gives you more clarity? It is this daily planning routine. And this is how it works. In the morning after I have my coffee and do my 10-minute meditation, I take a paper and pen and write down all the things which is in my mind, okay? And then I go through the list and put a number between one to 10 in terms of priority. And my whole motto in life is to finish the top three things for that particular day. That's it. And for those top three things, what I do is I'll block time, a one hour time block during the day to focus on that one particular thing. Say, for example, I have to write a blog post. Um, I, have to, I have a call with a the company, then I have to do a talk, right? That those are my top three things. So I will block time on my calendar just to focus on this one particular thing. And when I'm focusing on that, my phone is on do not disturb. There's no distractions and I really focus on that. And then when I say time blocks, it's just those one hour sessions. And again, I do it one hour. You could do it for 45 minutes. You could do it for an hour and a half. You can figure out which which timing works for you. But for me, one hour actually works after experimenting with the time frame. And then in the evening, before I end my day, I look at what are the different things which are still pending. And those things which are still pending gets carried over to the next day's to-do list. And then the whole process starts again the next day, the next day, the next day. And this is my daily task planning, daily task planning routine. And then I do what is called a weekly planning routine, usually on Saturdays or Sundays for 20 minutes. I carve out some time, right? This is the thing. I know as part of my work, I have to do five things, which is learning, reading, content creation, coaching, and speaking. And say, if you're a manager, figure out those five, six things which we have to do. Say, if you're a tester, figure out those four or five things you have to do as part of your job, okay? Then what you're going to do is proactively start assigning time blocks, which is one hour focus session blocks on a calendar to focus on those five, stops, five, six top things you have to focus on, right? So what I do is I look over my upcoming weeks and then start blocking my calendar for different tasks associated with these buckets because those are the major things which I need to focus on, right? So in my case, so every week I need to have two time blocks for re learning and reading, four time blocks for content creation, eight time blocks for career coaching, and rest is for speaking. And again, time blocks is one hour time period. So I do the daily planning routine and weekly planning routine. And this is the backbone of how I still stay sane and I can produce at a really high level because I have a very strict filtering system and I have a process. So this is my routine. Your time is your baby. You have to treat it carefully and it starts with this routine okay and again as and when you have questions keep putting it in the chat window we'll be answering them towards the end let's next let's talk about meetings so let me ask you this how many of you have been in unproductive meetings you can put a sad face on the chat window and of course kazoo always has amazing productive meetings i'm talking about <laughs> your previous company experiences, right? So put a sad face if you've had attended any unproductive meetings in your life. L let me see the chat window. There you go. Yeah, I see <laughs> some sad faces there. Yeah, the point is meetings is a, a huge time sucker and revenue sucker for the company and for you as well. Here. The, the things you see on the screen are some startling statistics about meetings. It's crazy how meeting can suck the life out of you. 
that's why you have to be really really mindful on what meetings you attend and why you're attending whether you really need to be in those meetings right there are two great ted talks which high, i highly recommend by david grady and jason fried um it's hilarious and they talk about meetings and how bad it is for companies I'm, again i'm not talking about all meetings are bad i'm talking about meetings which are bad there's a difference and i highly recommend these two talks to get more information but based on my experience leading teams and once i started this transformation process here are the rules i follow when it comes to meetings right first thing you need to ask yourself is do you really need the meeting <laughs> odds are 50 to 60 percent of the time you don't need a meeting literally you can talk to a person you know next to you and say hey can you just help me with this a meeting should not have more than seven to eight people. If it has more than that, then it's a conference, not a meeting. Something to think about. Say you already have the meeting. The meeting may needs to be clear. Okay, why is the meeting for? It has to have a clear agenda of what are you going to talk about. I hate meetings which are just, you know, with no agenda and it's just a waste of time. Remember those meetings where people are on their phone or on their laptop and they're not even paying attention? What's the use? No one is winning here. Start and finish meetings on time. That's really, really important. And then finally, this is really important, folks. Make sure you always have follow-up items and action items, clear action items after the end of the meeting. Most of the cases, they, uh, people forget that. And then they, again, have another meeting to talk about the exact same thing. And it's crazy. So here, these meeting strategies really, really help. It's again, a filtering system, which also gives you some mental health and it, it reduces some of your stress as well. <laughs> Let's talk about emails, man. There are 316 billion emails sent every year and there are 4.1 billion email users in the world. That's how much email communication has grown significantly. And research has found that when a person gets distracted when working, it takes on an average 23 minutes and 15 seconds to regain full focus and attention. And emails is one of the major culprit of that because how many times you've been working for, you know, I, uh, yeah, how many times you have actually focused and you're focusing on something then all of a sudden you get this email ping ping and then you try to read that email and then you just get carried away right that is a major source of stress and also email communication how many emails have this long email chains and then you it's just very stressful and it, you get spammed so how do you actually overcome reduce the stress when it comes to emails right yep slack in definitely has that effect chat windows definitely chat clients have that effect as well I totally agree so here are some effective email strategies first thing is you really need to have a clear subject line on what the email is about and then i firmly believe in bullet points so in my last job i was leading a team of 47 people across the globe and i was doing developer evangelism i was doing sales engineering i was heading customer success and then i was doing r d there's only so much time. So what I advise my direct reports is all emails should be three to four bullet points. That's it. Literally tell me three, four, the items which I need to know. It should be bullet point format. I don't want paragraph format. Next thing is an email should not be more than two email threads. If it's more than two email threads, then you need to pick up the phone and then, or get on a call with the person and sort it out. Do not, do not reply all for every freaking reply because you're spamming people. Another thing to think about. And finally, always need to, you need to mention deadlines in an email. You cannot just say, hey, can you finish this task? You have to mention, finish this task by Friday at 3 p.m. CST or EST. Mention the time zones as well, especially if you're working with distributed, globally distributed teams. So those are some things you want to keep in mind. Reminders. One of the biggest stressors in life is trying to keep up with things. That's why I use three different types of reminders to really help me. One is sticky notes. You'll always find sticky notes on my table because as and when I remember things, then I write it down. And then I have Google reminders. So say, for example, I have to follow up with someone. 
I will already have a Google reminder via email and via mobile phone notification. So I immediately, you know, get, uh, I get information about it. Then I have a Trello board where I actually manage my tasks just like a Kanban board so that I know what I have to work on and what needs to be followed up and stuff like that. Again, these are some of the things which I use. You could at least use one or two of these things and it really helps to reduce stress. Next is focusing and defocusing. Again, I have just two, three slides and then we'll open it up to questions. Research has found that the human mind can actually focus only to a max of one to one and a half hours. That's it. After that, you really have to take a break and then come back to what you're doing. So the way I focus and defocus is, for me, I, I use uh, exercise as my de-stressor. So I do 10, 15 push-ups in between time box sessions, and, or I go for a walk around the block. And those are some ways you could focus and defocus. The basic idea is you literally have to move away from the place you are at and physically get out of that place so that there's a change in mind. So that is something you want to keep in mind. And also do focus work. Whenever you're working, make sure your phone is on do not disturb. Or if you're working on site at a particular location, book a conference room. But if we want to do a focus work, I used to do that even in my previous two companies. Then I have separate playlists for different things I do. For example, when I'm writing, I listen to symphony music, right? Mozart and those kind of music. When I'm working out, it's hip hop or you know pop music. So literally, your mind gets tuned based on the music playlist. And this is this is also proven by research. I'm not just making up stuff. So for me, when I hear symphony music, immediately my mind get into the creative mode. Mode. And if I hear hip hop or pop music, then my mind gets into workout mode. Right. Again, it takes practice, but trust me, these things are actually backed by science and it takes a lot some experimentation okay meditation has been a big uh big thing in my life i was under heavy anxiety anxiety and depression medication but i really wanted to take a break because it was affecting my normal life so i started getting into the mindfulness space and meditation space i use an app called headspace again it's a meditation app. They do guided meditation. Similar to Headspace, you have Calm, you have Waking Up, and there's so many different meditation apps. And again, I'm a very skeptical person. I'm a tester by profession, so I don't believe things immediately. And I thought meditation was woo-woo stuff, but really it works. And it you can and the thing I love about Headspace is you can do a two-minute uh, meditation, three minute meditation, five minute meditation, 10 minute meditation. So you could literally control how much time you want to spend to get some headspace. So those are some things to keep in mind as well. And finally, seek professional help. <laughs> you know, it's time when you're comfortable seeking one. So I have a therapist. I, I've been seeing a therapist on and, off for the past, on and off for the past six years. And now for the past two and a half years, every Friday, I see a therapist, right? And in the Asian community where I come from, they have this taboo that, oh man, you're seeing a therapist, that means you have mental issues. No, it's about trying to get clarity, trying to de-stress and trying to get an objective view of things. That's what you want to do. And that's why you see a therapist. I see a therapist, my wife sees her own therapist, and we also have a couple's therapist. And again, our relationship is amazing. It's just to navigate the stresses of life, especially during the pandemic. So therapy is really good and really helpful. I highly recommend it to people, right? If you're going to care about your hearts, why don't you care about your minds? That is something you really want to think about. So there are three key things I want to leave you with, right? One is be selfish to be selfless. You have to take care of yourself first. If you are not mentally and physically happy, then you're not going to make others around you happy. You have to be selfish to be selfless. Second thing is you have to keep in mind that you have to constantly be asking this question, which is, are you surviving or are you thriving? Right? Are you surviving or are you thriving? In fact, today I made a LinkedIn post, go check it out. I talked about, are you surviving or thriving? Right now I feel I'm in surviving mode. That means I have to make some shifts in my routine. Right. 
And the final third thing you want to keep in mind is you cannot control the circumstances, okay? But you can control your actions, actions under any circumstances. You are in control of how you react to things. That is something you want to keep in mind. So with that being said, here are some bonus stuff and then we'll get into q and I wrote an article about mental health and how to work in agile teams <laughs> while preserving your mental health for InfoQ. I wrote an article. You can take, again, a picture of all these things if you want to refer to it. And I probably I'll also send you the slides. Also, for you folks here, uh, if you buy the paperback version of my book in the next 24 hours, I'm going to give you the, the ebook for free. And that is something which I could do to to reward you folks for listening to me. Something to think about. Also, I have an online shop where 50% of all profits go to charity. And this is my way of giving to people. And the rest 50% actually goes in maintaining my website and paying my sales tax. So literally, I don't make any money off it. But this go all money goes to pretty much the charity. And on the website, you'll see the different charities I have donated to. The, where your money goes to. So you can definitely check that out. If you want to see me live in action, I'm doing a career workshop with the United States. I know people are in Germany and UK and Europe, different places, but if at all you're in the United States, definitely you can come see me in Agile Testing USA. I also have a private Facebook group called Skyrocket Your Career where we actually talk about all these things. So if you're interested, definitely join. And finally, here is how you connect with me, my website, my email. If you just want to talk to me about anything, schedule a call with me and make sure you follow me on LinkedIn because I literally post content six times a week, six times a week and uh, on different topics. And today I posted a topic on are you surviving or thriving? So definitely go check it out, follow me, connect with me. And yes, I sorry I went a little bit over time, but uh, I get really into mental health because I can I get goosebumps just talking about it because I could still visualize me going through the journey. But that's pretty much what I had. Um, we can get to questions now. Wow, awesome. Thanks so much, Raj. Um, that was really great. And now we know also where we can get this cool t-shirt of yours. <laughs> oh, yes. So, we, uh, I need all the t-shirts, me and my wife, and we put all okay. the original quotes as well. So, yeah. Great stuff. Okay. Nice. So uh, now we're going to enter the Q&A. So I'm going to get uh, Jem back on the call. And uh, then we'll check which que questions there are. We have three at the moment. If you still have any, then uh, post them now. We have uh, literally seven minutes to go through them. Um, yeah, so. There was one question about how often I meditate. I just let people yeah. know that I meditate every day for 10 minutes using the Headspace app. Uh, that's the first thing I do in the morning after I have my coffee uh, to get some clarity and just calm my nerves. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So that's the first one answered. Um, then uh, Jem asked, I think that's aimed at you, Raj. Um, yes. Do you review your routine as you grow and learn and move through this mental health journey? Can you repeat that question? Sorry, you cut off a little bit. Uh, do you review your routine as you grow and learn and move through this mental health journey? Great question, 100%. Uh, I don't know whether people notice, but when I started the productivity hacks thing, the, in, on the slide, there was a subtitle saying experimentation is the key. So you as and when you start following routines, you have to keep tweaking it. Before I had a kid, my life was totally different. <laughs> and I had really awesome routines. Now I have a kid, I have to tweak my routines. And, and the way I'm talking, don't have this impression that I'm perfect with my routines and I'm this, you know, guy who does everything. But the, I'm also a work in progress. Sometimes I miss routines, and but I try to give myself some grace, like Jim was saying in our talk as well, give myself some grace and you're doing the best you can. But not having routines is very nerve wracking for me. It increases my anxiety, my panic attacks. So I really need to have structure. But yes, to answer the question, uh, routines are constant experimentation, but 
there's some things which I always follow, like the daily planning routine and the weekly planning routine and my meditation and my working out. If I don't work out, I go all crazy. My wife will tell you that. But the point is, yeah, those are my key things which I do. Okay, great. Well, there's currently no more questions from the audience, but I noted a few. Um, so, Jem, what you said earlier is something's better than nothing. Um, so you also interestingly mentioned experimentation, Raj. So here's a question uh, to both of you. Um, do you see a relation to agile methods, you know, taking care of your mental health and also uh, doing well, increasing your productivity without stre getting stressed out too much? Definitely. Personally, I think there's a lot of techniques you could apply either way. Right. Um, I do work reflection every Friday and personal reflection every Sunday. So that's very much in like every, like I have regular periods where I reflect on the week behind me. I set some targets for the week ahead of me, like very sort of retro planning all in one session. And like, you kind of have to be, sometimes you have to kind of be adaptable, right? Especially if you've got like caring responsibilities or whatever, sometimes like you would love to like, like as Raj said, right? a kid is a way of throwing chaos into any system right so sometimes you might have to tweak things to fit around other things you know and very much like agile right if there's a live production instance you drop what you're doing and you go run and do that and then you come back to it you know mm. so in my head there's a lot of things you can take and i think there's a lot of things you can take from looking after yourself into agile very much about like like psychological safety is essentially mental health work in agile right having those, building those spaces, building those routines, building that habit of checking in with yourself on a regular basis, right? You can absolutely do that outside of work, outside and inside work. Um, there's probably others I'll let Raj have um, a go, but yeah, I absolutely think there's a load of parallels between the two. Just add to what uh, Jim was saying, I firmly believe in the lean startup methodology, which is validator learning, which is build, measure and learn, right? It's the exact, 100% exact same thing. Agile is similar to our life. It's similar to everything, which is try the smallest thing possible, which I think both of us talked about that, and then try to see whether it's working, then tweak it if it's not working, and then learn from it, then again, try something else, right? During my uh, four-month self-exploration journey, as and when I was reading and listening to podcasts, reading books, listening to podcasts, I took a note of different practices. I had this huge list of like 20 things you know, 20, 25 things. What I did was started, prioritized them and started with one, two, three, then implemented them for two, three weeks, see whether it was working. Then, which was not working, then I went down the list, down the list, down the list. And that's how I came up with these structures, right? So coming back to your question, yes, it's small, small changes in your habits. And then you have to see which one works, which doesn't, and it's constant experimentation for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Um, we have a few minutes and I have another question. Uh, so, uh, Raj, you mentioned earlier that, you know, uh, you should actually realize when it's time to go see a therapist or to seek professional help. So in your case, uh, you had to really go get it, get a blackout and, uh, you know, collapse in the bathroom and your wife finding you. Um, so, I mean, not that we're trying to give medical advice to people here, but, um, so a question to both of you, um, how can someone tell uh, when's the right point actually to to seek out that professional help and be, before it's too late? At least for me, in my case, uh, you have to, yes, mine is an extreme case. I wouldn't advise people fainting before trying to get, seek help. Uh, I, I, a commonality is between what Jim and I do is reflection. So trying to see, okay, looking at triggers and see what you're doing if you're overeating if you're drinking six beers a day which i was doing and then uh, if you're eating two extra large deep dish pizzas along with six beers which also i was doing and if you're doing that repeatedly over a period of time for two three weeks and then you feel sorry for yourself those are actually triggers that okay you really really need help so what i would do is uh seek a trusted partner it could a significant other a friend to talk about it. You don't immediately have to go to a therapist if you don't feel comfortable. And then 
that then you will know, okay, you'll realize, okay, you know what? I really need help. So just being cognizant of different triggers. And I still go through that. For example, yesterday, I didn't want to drink beer. I love beer, which Ron knows. And but yesterday was the <laughs> common basketball championship. And then I drank a beer, right? But even though I didn't want to do it. But then, okay, I realized it. Okay, you know, I, I did something which I didn't want to do. But again, let's, let's, let's mm. take a step back and then, you know, I can restart. So being cognizant of the triggers, I think, is what really helped to make the decision. Uh, based on my experience, uh, I don't know what Jem thinks about it. Um, so generally speaking, for most people, you do have to hit whatever your form of rock bottom is. That is how the pattern goes. I had to do it. You had to do it. Um, what I would... So in my head, I therapy and coaching are very similar. In fact, in the UK, the first steps to being a counsellor and the first steps to being, to being a life coach to get the qualifications are exactly the same. You start off with the same course and then you diverge. So if so, what I would do is get to, a, well, if you can figure out when nothing is working, if your normal day to day isn't working, you're doing all things and you're still not feeling great, you're still feeling those triggers. You're leaning into numbing activities, eating, drinking, whatever substance of choice you are um, mitigating with, getting lost in video games, getting lost in social media, that kind of disconnect between you and your feelings and your body. There's a weird like, mind-body disconnect you can get when you're struggling loads. Those are the warning signs, right? Those are where I'd be like, because I do it now, right? Same. I've had a therapist for like six years, but like a couple of weeks ago, I would, I finally kind of realized that I was avoiding reflecting and because I, I was avoiding reflecting because I didn't want to sit with my feelings because my feelings were getting a little bit scary they were getting a little bit big and I'm like oh I need to pull up this therapy session because I need to get help right and so it's about learning those kind of triggers those kind of the way you respond to things not going great and catching yourself and sometimes catching yourself with therapy because you don't actually have to wait until you hit rock bottom to get therapy. You can get therapy at any time, right? You can go to, um, there's various websites where you can find like uh, registered counselors and that kind of stuff. Or if your work has an employee assistance program, things like that, just to talk about things. They are like a coach, but specifically for mental health, right? So you can just talk to them about things and they will ask questions and you will learn things about yourself. Great. Final words. So we're at the end of our session. I'd like to say thanks so much, Jem uh, and Raj, for your fabulous talks today, for sharing your personal stories and your experiences. That was really great. Um, so uh, one final question to you, Raj. Are you going to share the slides as well? Um, yep, I will later? do. I will uh, send a, a Google Drive link, which mm -hmm. I don't have yet. I will send it to Ron and Ron will make sure all the attendees get it. So, okay, awesome. Thanks a lot for that. Great. Then, thanks to everyone for attending. Uh, we have another great Kazoo Tech Talk uh, lined up later in April. It's going to be a highlight. Uh, we're not going to share what it's going to be, but uh, uh, listen up for it. And if you're registered, then uh, you will get notified about that. So, I'll leave you with that. Um, Thank you everyone for, for joining us and have a great morning, day or evening, depending on where you're located. All right then, bye-bye. Thanks folks.